on today's episode of the John Campbell Show podcast. Yes, I actually did win the Mega Millions uh, lottery last night. Eight dollars. <laughs> woo! Woo! But also today, we're going to talk about Paramount. Is apparently has big plans for their G.I. Joe franchise. That according to one of the stars of their movies. Also, Last of Us Season 2, you saw reports saying that Pedro Pascal wrapped his shooting on Season 2 in less than a month with six more months to go or four more months to go in the shooting of it. Yeah, apparently that report just isn't true. We're going to discuss that. Also, if you open up Disney+, Plus and you saw your new Hulu page in there, as of today, they're launching Hulu integrated with Disney+. Plus. We're going to talk about some of the ramifications. And Timothy Chalamet has signed a Big deal with Warner Brothers. We're going to talk about that and a whole bunch more. The John Campus Show podcast starts $8 richer right now. <laughs> Did someone win that? By the way? Woo! That's a lot of cocaine. Hey, well, greetings and salutations, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the best damn movie related show uh, on the planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast. Coming to you from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by cocaine, apparently. <laughs> I am, of course, your host, uh, John Campion, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or even different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio today, Cocaine Bear number yeah. one, Ray Ora. What's up, crackhead? <laughs> Sitting over here, we got Jonathan Voico. It's just coffee. <laughs> Writer, director, producer, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robert yeah. Meyer Burnett. Oh. <laughs> they should be my camera titles today. Part Ooh, man, part most people don't actually know your hair is actually brown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just, that's all I'm saying. Uh, most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making today's show part of your day. And here's how today's show is going to go. We're going to start off by talking about those topics that I listed off. And then in the second part of the show, lucky you, we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you guys have a thought, theory, opinion, question, observation that you'd like us to address, as long as it's appropriate for us to address on the show, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature over in the live chat and fire that on in. All right, guys. With that down, let's get things going with this. Under the category of movies that suck, G.I. <laughs> Joe Snake Eyes. Woo, that movie was bad. All sorts of bad. Several levels deep of cocaine bad. It starred, though, I was really excited about it because, number one, it's a Snake Eyes movie. Number two, it has Henry Golding in it, who is fantastic. Number three, I'm a big fan of the show Warrior, and Andrew Koji was in it. And it's like, yes, so much yes. You don't have to do a lot in this Snake Eyes movie to make me happy. And somehow, they found a way to make everybody unhappy. A truly terrible movie um, with just some of the strangest, oddest choices. Like, we're going to have all this ninja sword fighting action, but we're going to make sure you can't see a frame of it. It's like just one of the dumbest things ever. Well, then you guys remember they had Transformers Beast Wars come out. And at the end of it, for spoiler alert, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, you know, at the end in the post credit scene, they introduced G.I. Joe, which got a lot of people wondering, oh, are they going to do a G.I. Joe Transformers crossover? Of course, the box office results of Transformers Beast Wars may hinder that. But Henry Golding is saying, wait a minute. Paramount's got big plans for G.I. Joe. Big plans. Big plans. This comes to us from the folks over at Superhero Hype who said this. Snake Eyes actor Henry Golding says that Paramount has some grand, grand plans for the G.I. Joe franchise. <laughs> Speaking with comicbook.com, Golding provided a brief update regarding what the future of G.I. Joe franchise might look at, look like. I mean, says Henry, Le uh, Lorenzo de Bonaventura is a busy man and a phenomenal producer, and it's in safe hands, Golding said. Whatever happens... I think it's going to be a combination of what has come and what is to come. Well, of course. That's profound. I mean... By the way, that's, that's, that is profound. That's literally how all of life works. That's, that's, that's how the timeline generally flows, but okay. <laughs> then he f followed up by saying, I think Paramount have some grand, grand plans. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> this brings up a question. I don't personally know anybody. Not, I, I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying I don't personally know anybody that doesn't have a fond place in their heart for G.I. Joe. 
right? Everybody's got a pleasant place in their heart for G.I. Joe from the nostalgia or, or whatever it is. And I think everybody would love to see a good or great, yeah, that's a great picture, a, great a picture. good or great G.I. Joe movie. I think we all <laughs> would love that. I also don't know anybody that liked any of the G.I. Joe movies, um, particularly Snake Eyes. I think I know a couple of people that know that like the one Channing Tatum or The Rock was in, but I don't know. I don't personally know anybody that liked the Snake Eyes movie. I'm sh Again, I'm sure they exist. I'm sure some of you might like it. I don't personally know anybody that does. And Ray, maybe you can look up for me the box office result of that oh, well, G.I. Joe Snake yeah, Eyes. Is it even listed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been delisted. <laughs> it's been let's, see. let's see. Hold on. Let's check it, it was out. Demonetized. Uh, demonetized. Uh, um, but I just, I just don't know anybody. What do, what do you got? Well, we got a four zero, forty million baby. worldwide. Worldwide. Are we talking about Snake Eyes or Snake Eyes? The, a GI Joe spinoff 40. centered around character Snake Eyes, Henry Gold, Golding. Forty million worldwide. I didn't know it was that long. Oh, wow. it was thirteen million. I didn't know it was 40 million. 28 million domestically, 11 million internationally. Did that even cost cover the catering costs? Oh, wow. Boy. Of the movie? Now we got Okay. Bit. I mean, okay, not if so... Vin Diesel was on set. No, with all the friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I Listen, all all due respect to Henry and I love him. I mean, by the way, he's one of my picks to maybe even be the next Bond. I think Henry would be a fabulous Bond. All due respect to him. And all due respect to Paramount, who I like very much. I like the studio. They've they've done some really, really good things, despite the fact that they're in big financial trouble and the hardships they've had. They've done some really cool projects. And I actually like a lot the way they handle themselves. That being said, what kind of grand plans can you have for G.I. Joe at this point? It's, it's like an having like a huge pimple on your butt and saying, I got big plans for that. Like what what plans can you have? That are remotely interesting it's, or good. Especially against the Transformers. That is like the biggest mismatch ever. Like, who, who's going to come out on that one? That's got to be the Transformers, right? Right, Rob? <clears throat> I, I, look, <laughs> to, me, to me, it's a tonal issue, John. I mean, th what I don't understand about the G.I. Joe franchise as a film franchise is when Michael Bay took over Transformers, Transformers was for kids and it was a big toy commercial. But that first Transformers movie had state-of-the-art special effects. It had Megan Fox draped over the hood of a car. And it was really about a story about a boy in his, his car who came to life. And listen, I think I can count on one hand the number of times I have wept in a movie. The first time in that Transformers movie, when Optimus Prime for the first time comes rolling out of that dark alley with oh, the mist. Yeah. And then the camera starts doing the circle camera around him as he's transforming for the first time. And you hear that going on. I, I kid you not. I had I had liquid coming out of my well, eyes. At that the thing, point. Yeah. And the thing about it was, was it took a, a, a children's cartoon franchise and it made it functional. I mean, Spielberg was a producer on that. My problem with the G.I. Joe movies is it's always been goofy. They've never <laughs> they've never treated it. Like, if you look at something like the John Wick franchise, the John Wick franchise, like, it has the Continental, and it's got, you have to have a coin to get in these doors, and it's got a lot of a lot of stuff that could be goofy, but the tone is deadly serious, and the stunts and the action is incredible. And when they go to these European locations, and it, 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 it's a world that you want to be immersed in. G.I. Joe needs to be cool. That Snake Eyes movie should have been the John Wick of the G.I. Oh, Joe it, it should have been, franchise. It should have been great. And it should have been great. And and when you're going to have a movie that exists to show action and fighting, get a team of people that knows how to choreograph action scenes. Because we live in a world where we've got the raid. We've got the John Wick movies. The, the level of action and uh, combat that people are used to, the Fall Guy. They've talked about how the Fall Warrior. Guy is... We were just talking about Warrior. And too. Warrior. The Fall Guy exists to show stunt work and and it's a it's an ode to old school stunts and there's a lot of unassisted cg i mean there's cg too but the gi joe franchise all they have to do is make it adult and feel adult and it's a it's always been whether you were seeing the this the steven um um the director who made the first gi joe movie you know who directed like uh van helsing and the, the mummy movies and mm -hmm. steven oh yeah the, when i watched even summer is that steven name? summers yeah it was just goofy. 
And I wanted it to be cool. Yeah. And if they made G.I. Joe cool, anything can work. Um, but they, they still think of it as a kid's thing. And they've got to make it appeal and make it badass. Yeah. And if they make it badass, people will go. One word. Supentor. Oh, okay. <laughs> do not talk down on my dude. Right I'm, not, I'm not talking down. Uh, but here, 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 here. Do you think this is where uh, the property is hampered by, let's say, the guidelines that maybe the... Because they, they want to sell toys, right? Yep. Obviously, they sold toys for this, even the Rise of Cobra. They had a little rock, whatever. Do you think they made that a hampers toy, the properties? The you know what? I, I think that's a great observation. I, I think I think what will what will be a roadblock, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> what will be a roadblock <laughs> to making these properties Bonsage. into movies that could really be good will be the people themselves financing the making of the movies, yep. the toy company, because they still want them to first and foremost be toy stuff. Listen, and I think G.I. Joe, a property like G.I. Joe and Transformers, by the way, and other properties like it. I think they are in a unique position where they should have a fundamental philosophical shift from being, you know what? Let's stop trying to think of ways to make money off these properties in toys, even though we are toy companies. Let's focus in on how much money we could make of them as IP on the screen. And let's make these $700 million films because we could make more money that way than we could in the toys. Because let's let's face it, Transformers toys don't sell the way that they did when I was a kid. Nope. GI Joe toys do not sell kids the way. Kids don't when play with toys like the way that we did. When we no, were kids. they don't. They pick up their iPads now, right? And so maybe if they had, like to your point, Ray, if they had a, a philosophical, you know, shift and said, maybe GI Joe now is primarily a movie and secondary a toy. Yeah. Maybe they could because listen. Look, it's it's still the old formula, right? The more popular the movie, the more toys you will sell. Yes. So maybe focus on making the movies as great as possible. Let them skew a little bit more adult, and maybe you'll sell a lot more toys. You'll buy them. I mean, they I'll lost a lot of money. Uh, how, how, you still see uh, Snake Eye Origin peg warmers right now on the shelves, like uh, for dirt cheap. I'm sorry, a what warmer? A peg warmer. Like, you know, where the toy it just sits there and no one buys it. What's a peg warmer? It's the peg, peg, the pegs that they, the, pegs the cards that they, that they the slide onto the pegs that are on the. All right, the I thought store. you were talking about your sex toy. Oh uh, no, 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 that's a uh, okay. peg warmer. Peggy, <laughs> peg warmer. Peggy. I call that pegs. I am not familiar with the peg warmer. Yeah, <laughs> shelf warmer. I mean, the, anyway, there's a anyway, guys. Question is for you. What do you think about this? Henry Golding is saying Paramount has grand plans for GI Joe, but I, I don't know what kind of plans you can have unless something like that philosophical shift happens. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? I, I'm going to give a little bit of a spoiler warning here. That Look, I, I am sure 95% of you watching this already know what we're about to talk about. I'm sure there's probably just a few precious of you that don't. But I do want to give a little bit of a spoiler warning up at the top <coughs> that we're going to be talking about something that happens in last of us two that again i'm sure most of you already know but i just want to give you that spoiler warning if you don't want to know anything even something that all of your other friends already know you might want to skip this video come back to it after you watch the show that being said so in last of us two the main well or at least one of the two main protagonists of last of us one Joel dies very brutally and very, very early in, in the second game, very early in the second game to the point w which then shifts the tone of last of us two to becoming more of a vengeance um, thing. And, and one of the greatest stories ever told in my opinion in video game history. And it's a real study about what pain, how pain can change people even good people and turn you into something that maybe you never thought you could be because that's what the power of pain at any rate. So there's also been though, a lot of talk that Greg Mazin and who's his partner on that on uh, Greg Mazin and Druckmann and Druckmann, Neil Druckmann. that Mazin and Druckmann have dropped hints that they're going to turn. I don't know if they've ever officially said this. Maybe they have, but the word is that they're going to turn last of us Two, the game into two seasons of television and that they're actually going to have 
Pedro Pascal's Joel character have a much bigger and longer role in the show than he does in the video game. Okay, I tell you all that to lay the uh, background for this. Yesterday, reports came out, you probably saw them on the headlines of all of your favorite trades, that after just starting to shoot Last of Us Season 2, which started shooting just in mid-February, we're now just past mid-March, and they're shooting until the end of August, that Pedro Pascal had wrapped shooting, that Pedro Pascal was done. He had no more uh, shooting to do for Last of Us 2, which then got a lot of people, understandably, chatting about how, I guess they do kill him off real quick in season two. Because if he's only shot for a few weeks, he must not be in much of it at all. Blah, blah, blah. Well, hold on to your hats for a second. Because despite the fact that that ran everywhere yesterday, HBO has stepped in. This is coming to us from uh, IGN, who wrote the following. Peter Pascal is not done. Filming the last of a season two, after all, HBO says. Uh, HBO has confirmed that Pedro Pascal still has filming to do for The Last of Us Season 2, telling IGN that rumors suggesting otherwise are not accurate. Rumors surrounding the star's filming schedule originated from a reliable insider, Daniel Richman, who shared the update on his Patreon page. His report said that Pascal has wrapped shooting while stating that filming for the rest of the season wasn't ex- was wasn't expected to conclude until August of 2024. So again, still got a while to go. Okay, so there's two interesting things here to to banty about and discuss. The one is, this seems to confirm the whispers that we've been hearing that they are going to elongate Pedro Pascal's role in the second, and maybe even take up all of season two, and that maybe the second game is indeed being split into two seasons. Whether that's factually true or not, we'll find out. The second thing that's interesting, though, is that this kind of brings up again the notion of where information comes from. Information that we run with and and we talk about and that a lot of fans assume is true. Now, I've got it for myself as a movie fan. I have a simple rule. I don't believe any rumor or report that comes from anybody other than the major trades, Variety, The Hollywood Reporter, you know, Entertainment Weekly, things like that. I don't believe anything unless it comes from there. That doesn't mean it's not necessarily true, but say when something comes from Daniel Richman, right, who is who is oftentimes reliable, but not always, right? So when it comes from somebody like that, I, t- I don't believe it, but I take it and I file it and say, okay, this could be true. This, this might be true. But I'll buy into it once I see it. Because if it is true, Variety and The Hollywood Reporter and the other trades will at some point report on it as well, and then we can take it as lock, stock, fact. But the reality is, even some of the best guys out there, the scoopers that are out there, they will get things like this wrong, right? They, They can often be right, and then they're backed up by the major trades, and I think they should be paid attention to. Um, like Jeff Schneider is another guy. I think Jeff is super reliable. Yep. But even Jeff, who I have a world of respect for, even Jeff, when he says something, I'm like, okay, interesting. That could be really cool. I'm going to file that away, but I'm not going to bank on it until somebody else also backs up what he says. Just because he's one guy. He's not the, he's not Variety. He's not the Hollywood Reporter, right? So there's a super important place and role for guys like Jeff and Daniel to play in our fandom. Absolutely. Um, But I I just think, again, it just goes to show that when these reports come out, we as fans have to take where they come from very seriously and not completely accept them as fact until we hear one of the larger trades confirm it. Because, listen, that's a big difference. Like, if, if Pedro Pascal had wrapped shooting, that tells us a lot about The Last of Us Season 2 and how big his role is going to be and when or not he does die or doesn't die or whatever, right? And the fact that he is not done shooting is a massive difference. So it can change the perception of fandom a lot. And that's just why I say, yeah, when reports like that come out, we talk about them on our show, but we're always very, very quick to point out when we do, remember guys, this may or may not be true. It hasn't been reported in the major trades yet. So I just think it's, it's kind of a cautionary tale for us fans. Anyway, Rob, Knowing that he is not done shooting yet, how big right now do you speculate? Because we're only speculating at this point. 
How big or small role do you think Pedro is going to be playing in Last of Us Season 2, which I cannot wait for? And, and you know, is there some cautionary stuff for us as just film fans in general? Is this a really good reminder to us that we about how we rank the information we get? I don't know. What do you think? Well, we know for a fact that he's a very busy man this year. And I think, you know, there's something called block shooting uh, when they're making a show yeah. or a movie where a character... Uh, and I'm sure that they wrote all these scripts before they went into production. So they had all the scripts ready to go, and that allows them to what is called block shooting, which means they might shoot all of Pedro Pascal's scenes at one time and shoot him out. So they've got all of his That's scenes. That's standard, by the way. That happens all the time. Happens all the time. Yeah. And, and, and so that way, because a lot of the time, you know, characters aren't in all of an episode. They might only be half an episode. They, it feels like they're there for the entire episode. But so they could have scheduled him to shoot him out so it's even though he might get he might work for a month or two they could get everything they need from him for the entire season possibly um but also if they do follow along the story of last of us two and it's what happens to him fairly early on that could be the turning point of season one mm. halfway yeah. through i mean i would think that they might figure out a way to leave it as a cliffhanger i mean how to end a season right <laughs> but yeah. uh i don't think he's gonna make it that far <laughs> i really don't because the storyline of the game and the way it's the way it's set up i think it's it's gonna be a brian cox and succession thing episode three episode four maybe and then people their jaws are gonna hit the floor and so um that's what i think that he's probably not in a whole lot of the season but he's in a substantial amount of it you know, because they have to set you up before they can tear the rug out from under you. Yeah. So, look, I'm excited. I think that The Last of Us, of all the stuff we've covered on this show, it might be one of the most surprising shows ever in terms of quality that it delivered. Because we're all dubious about video game adaptations. And it's clearly so head and shoulders above any video game adaptation. And it provided an incredible drama. The changes they made to the game just added to the mythology of it all wonderful show if that's your thing and i think that they're gonna the craig mazin who made chernobyl's which is one of the great tv miniseries of the modern age and Druckmann being involved the creator of the game i think we're gonna get something equally as special um and i'm excited for it man whatever they do because the quality level that season one they've earned my trust you know you also bring up the thing about changes whatever a lot of people forget that season one of the last of us made some significant changes from the narrative in the game yep. and all the changes they made at, at least as far as i can remember actually improved the story for the screen you know Denis van did the same with dune like there are some significant changes from the book to the first two movies and it's going to be interesting to see how much more liberty you know mazen and Druckmann take going into season two and uh, and where that all goes anyway guys question is for you what do you think about this? Apparently, Pedro Pascal, contrary to reports that were flying around yesterday, is not done or wrapped shooting on season two of The Last of Us. But how much more does he have to go? The rest of the way? Just a little bit more? Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? The world is streaming. The world is streaming. Now, television as a whole is like a century-old medium, practically, at this point, it's getting there. And it evolves at a certain pace. The, the, when you track the evolution of television, it's, it's changes and shifts that happen over the course of decades, right? Streaming, on the other hand, has the lifespan of a fruit fly. It's, it's going through its life cycle real fast. It had its big explosion, it had its introduction, its birth, the big explosion with the pandemic coming. And then just a few years later, massive, massive reshifting of priorities, right? Now we see a lot of things like it seemed like every five minutes, a new streaming service was popping up. Now it seems like they're dropping like flies. We're seeing, you know, mergers and all this kind of stuff. And we all started, you guys at home and us as well, we all started to speculate that after this proliferation of the streaming mandates, we were going to start to see a contraction. We were going to start to see more services get bundled, and we've already started see, seeing it, right? I think it was Verizon 
with they had a deal that get the, the, a certain Verizon plan and you get a membership to this major streaming service and this major streaming service bundled in. We've seen other services already talking about they'll put together package deals. Well, one of the more prominent ones, of course, is all the ones under the Disney umbrella, particularly Disney Plus and Hulu. And we heard and speculated for a while that we were going to see Disney Plus and Hulu merge in and see Hulu on Disney Plus. They did a beta of it. But as of today, it's there. Open up your Disney Plus. You see Star Wars, Pixar, <clears throat> Marvel, Nat Geo, and you're going to see Hulu. This comes from the folks over at Variety <clears throat> who wrote the following. Subscribers to both Disney Plus and Hulu will now see the full Hulu experience inside the Disney Plus app. And the Mouse House wants to use the official launch of the integrated product to convert standalone Disney Plus customers to two service subs. It's kind of brilliant. Starting on Wednesday, March 27th, that's today, the full Hulu on Disney Plus experience is rolling out in the U.S. That means that Hulu titles will be integrated into personalized content recommendations, sets, and collections on Disney Plus. Under the previous beta integration, uh, which launched last December, Hulu content was presented in a separate hub on Disney. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Switching Hulu tightly into Disney Plus is aimed at driving up total viewing hours among customers who already have both streamers, but who may not necessarily be aware of the breadth of content that they can watch. Higher engagement with a streaming service is correlated with lower cancellation fees. And remember, the number one enemy of streaming services right now is not other streamers, it's churn. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, churn is a phrase that we all kind of use that basically means you sign up for a service to watch a show. When you're done watching that show, you cancel that service, and then you sign back up later on when another show comes around that you want to watch. Meanwhile, standalone Disney Plus subscribers in the U.S. will be in for a hard sell on Hulu. They'll see the Hulu content. So even if you're not a Hulu subscriber, you're going to see the Hulu hub in Disney Plus. Mm. They'll see the Hulu content yeah. promoted in the app accompanied by a new upgrade option in multiple places in Disney Plus and across additional devices, prompting them to get Hulu. Bundle plans, now this is interesting. They're going aggressive on their pricing. Bundle plans with both services cost $9.99 a month with ads. That's only $2 more than Disney Plus Basic with ads by itself. And $19.99 a month without ads versus the $14 a month for a standalone Disney Plus Premium. Disney Plus and Hulu each remained available as standalone offerings. All right. So basically, this is actually pretty smart on their part. Merge those things in together. Show people what they're missing. If you're already a subscriber, great. You're going to see more content than you realized was there, and they're hoping to get more streaming hours out of you. So that's smart right there. But number two, this is smart, although a little sneaky. Even if you're not a Hulu subscriber... You're going to see popping up in your carousel all these great things you can watch on Hulu. And then you click on, yeah, I'm going to watch it. Click, great, just sign up. Mm -hmm. Just sign up. And so it's kind of devious, a little bit underhanded, but also kind of brilliant. And I'll tell you what, $19.99, given the current pricing of each individual service, 20 bucks a month to have Hulu and Disney and all the content on both ad-free, that's a that's a good deal. That's a pretty good deal. Anyway, Rob, uh, you see this. So a couple of questions for you. All right. What do you think about this move isolated, right? Like that Disney's now bringing all the Hulu stuff, something a lot of people always speculated they would do. The uh, aggressive pricing, the underhanded kind of marketing. But do you think this is just the beginning? Do you think we're going to see more and more consolidation happening amongst the streaming sphere? I don't know. What do you see about this? No doubt. I mean, it, it is going to be consolidation because, John, you know, the only thing that gets people to watch anything is good programming. I mean, people tune in, and what does Hulu have on it currently right now? Our favorite show, Shogun. Shogun. You know, it comes over there. I've uh, And what 20th Century Studios has been providing, Hellraiser, Prey, that that movie, there was an alien invasion oh, yeah. movie. They no did. one will save us. Or no, no, no one will save you. Yeah, or yeah, no, yeah no one will save you. Another, uh, again, a 20th Century Studios movie. I don't understand. I, I will never understand why Disney Plus is not promoting. I mean, it's a 20th Century Studios movie, but Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes is coming out May 10th. 
It's the 10th Planet of the Apes movie. Wow. There's a TV series, an animated series. They've never remastered the, plan, the original Planet of the Apes movies. It's crazy to me that they don't. But the only reason people tune in to watch stuff is if it's good. If they have lots of good programming. And that's it. That's the only reason. Streamers thought, I think there was a, the overall thought was that we're just, you're just going to subscribe just because we're a great streaming service. But at the end of the day, what is a streaming service? It provides entertainment. That's all people are looking for. And you've got to keep great shows coming on. The more content that's available, especially we've seen, what do people love? Legacy content. They're going to go back and watch their favorite shows again and again and yeah. again. So Hulu, you bring in all the Fox shows. You've got them on Disney Plus too. Eventually Hulu will go away entirely and they'll just incorporate Hulu into Disney Plus and all that programming will become under one roof. Because remember, Hulu's not international. It's only domestic. Right. Now, internationally, Disney Plus already does something like this. They have... But when you log into Disney Plus, you've got Marvel, Pixar, but then I think it's called Star. Yeah, stars, yeah. stars or Star. No, yeah. Star Plus. Or, star Plus. Yeah, it's Star. Like whatever it is, and eventually Hulu will go away. But it's genius that they're they're now being able to charge more for it, because like you said, you click on I want to watch Shogun. Oh, I have to pay more, and you will pay more. <laughs> you will pay more, especially for that just a two dollar increase for now. Yeah, that's, that's like, two for bucks. I get both for two bucks. Yeah, it's... Hulu by itself ad free right now is seventeen ninety nine. So again, for two dollars more, you could get ad free for Hulu and Disney. Hulu Plus. and Disney Plus. I, yeah. it's crazy. It's really and you good. know the Disney app for whatever they do a great their presentation's great stuff in four K Dolby Vision the sound all of it's very very good. So I have no problem paying extra money for that. Fantastic. All right, guys. Question is for you. What do you think about this? I am probably now going to go change my plan. I I, I, yep. I am just a Disney Plus subscriber and a Hulu subscriber. I'm going to go cancel those and just sign up for the, the dual bundle if for no other reason, just so I can watch Shogun, watch a courtesan, try to talk Mariko into a threesome, watch that on repeat all day. Anyway, 69, <laughs> dudes! <laughs> Whatever you guys think about this, <laughs> jump on down to the comment section below and let us know your... Thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? It is turning into Timothy Chalamet's world, and we just kind of live in it. Uh, Timothy Chalamet, of course, right now is, I, I mean, the star of the two biggest films of the past eight months, or seven months, whatever it is, Wonka, which made well over $600 million, Dune Part Two, which is a close, approaching $600 million. Well, both of those are Warner Brothers films. And as such, Warner Brothers wants to stay in the Timothy Chalamet business. And apparently, Timothy Chalamet wants to stay in the Warner Brothers business because they just signed a first look deal that is going to be very lucrative. Uh, this comes just from the folks over at Variety uh, who write the following. Oh, there we go. Maybe. <laughs> yes. Warner Brothers is doubling down on the business of Timothy Chalamet. Uh, the studio signed a multi year feature film deal with the actor to collaborate on future projects as a star and as a producer. Uh, Chalamet led back-to-back -back box office hits for Warner Brothers with last December's Wonka at $632 million globally, and this March's Dune Part Two at $575 million globally and counting. According to the studio, he became the first actor in four decades to star in the top two domestic films that were released in an eight-month span. This is neat. Chalamet will enjoy a salary bump. After those box office riches, the actor earned more than $8 million for Wonka, according to sources. Now, he's looking at paydays in the double digits for leading roles in the film studio. Now, this is where the new deal comes into play. Mike DeLuca and Pam Abdi, the co-chairs and CEOs of Warner Brothers Motion Picture Group, said that they are thrilled that Chalamet has chosen our studio to be his creative home. As a part of the First Look Agreement, Chalamet can make movies elsewhere, but Warner Brothers will get first dibs on backing his potential projects. Okay. So what this basically means, because the movie business is different than the sports business, right? When, you know, uh, I'm trying to come up with a player. Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani. <laughs> when Shohei Otani signs a $700 million deal with the Los Angeles, I almost said the Lakers, with the <laughs> Los Angeles Dodgers, he cannot go play for other people. He has to play for the Dodgers and only for the Dodgers period. That is not the way it works in Hollywood. When you're an actor, like if you're an executive, yes, you can only work right. for that company. But the way this deal is going to work is like, okay, 
So Chalamet is also becoming a producer. He's producing the upcoming Bob Dylan movie that he's going to be starring, starring in. Uh, Mangold's directing. Yeah, that's right. James Mangold's directing that. And so the deal they've signed with him is, number one, we're going to keep coming to you with projects. But number two, any projects that you come up with, Timothy Chalamet, any projects that you start, you want to be a producer of, that you want to spearhead, all that kind of stuff, you can do those with other studios, but we get first dibs. That's basically what a first look deal is. So, for example, let's say I was signed a first look deal with Ray Ora for oh the boy. John Campia YouTube channel. What a horror. Right? Now, what that means is... What are you going to look at? If Ray comes up with an idea for a show about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles toy collecting, hmm. right? Let's say he comes up with a show idea for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle toy collecting. What a... <laughs> if I have a first look deal with Ray, what that means is I'm the first guy he has to come to, to with, and I'm the first guy who gets the option to finance it, make it a part of my network, all that kind of stuff. But if I say, you know what? I, I think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are played out. I, I, don't, I don't think I want to pick up this show, Ray. Then Ray can go, okay, no problem. And then he can go and talk to Harloff. And say maybe bring his thing over to Harloff or, or talk to Alba and bring his his Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's free to then shop it around and, and do the movie elsewhere. But even if I turn it down, his next idea, he still has to come to me first. Mm, yeah. And I get first option to go it. Now, that doesn't mean that other studios can't come to Timothy Chalamet and say, hey, we're doing, um, I don't know, Smokey and the Bandit Returns. And let's say- uh, It's Paramount. Universal. What's that? That's Universal. Oh, is that Universal? Okay, Universal comes to him and says, we want to do a, a, a resurgence. Smoke. You're going to play Burt Reynolds' great-grandson. Dude, I'd watch the hell out of that. I would watch the hell out of that, too. Only now they're driving He's EV, bound electric down, vehicles. 18 wheels are rolling. <laughs> and then Timothy Chalamet is free to accept acting jobs in other studios as well. But again, when he comes up with projects, he's got to do it there. And listen, Rob, he's had tremendous success with Warner Brothers right now, and he's making a lot of money with them. Uh, so not kind of surprised to hear this. This is a big deal for this. A win for Warner Brothers is a big deal for Chalamet. What do you take away from this? Well, I think it's great. You know, it, it's in a way it's a move back to more of a classical Hollywood, even that was existing in the 90s. Warner Brothers, they called them shingles. You get to hang yep, your hang shingle, shingle in the there. studio. Um, I think this is a, a great idea because obviously when you get into like Warner Brothers used to be, well, they're still in the Clint Eastwood business. Malpaso, Clint Eastwood's company, has had its shingle on the Warner lot for half a century. Kubrick was at uh, Warner Brothers for a long time. Joel Silver, Richard Donner, you know, they were producers, but and actors have, if you're, if you're doing good business, you keep doing good business. And I think, you know, there was a contraction in the industry and they don't want to pay what's called an overhead deal. You know, first look deal or an overhead deal, same kind of thing, you explained it really well. You get to develop projects. And I'll say what can come out of it is look at what Jordan Peele did. Jordan Peele has a yeah, deal. Yeah, that's a great example. At Universal. You know, and what does he do? He's like, I want to release this movie under, and we've got it coming out next, what, next week? Monkey Man. Yeah, Monkey Man. Monkey Man is something that Jordan Peele and his association with Universal, it's not a Jordan Peele joint, but he now picked it up for distribution, got Universal to release it. So these kinds of things allow... Um, like Eddie Murphy had a deal like this at Paramount in the eighties. I mean, then you wind up getting stuff like Harlem nights, which maybe wasn't the best idea, but still, you know, <laughs> Timothy Chalamet, his taste is great. He's worked with some world-class filmmakers. And I would imagine Warner Brothers sees a terrific future in this. And Timothy Chalamet is, uh, like you always point out, he's a great actor. I can't wait to see him as Bob Dylan. He's obviously already got a very diverse background and he's been in Warner Brothers movies before Christopher Nolan's interstellar. I keep forgetting that he was in Interstellar. Yeah, I keep you know, forgetting that he's uh he's this kid's going places, dude. Not just to Arrakis either. <laughs> Not just to Arrakis uh, or to the Chocolate Factory, guys. Question is for you: <laughs> What do you think about this? Whatever your thoughts are, jump down to the comment section below. My voice is going for some reason, and leave <clears throat> your thoughts there. <laughs> all right, guys. With that all down. <clears throat> We're going to take just a quick second here and thank a sponsor of our show before we get on to take your live questions. Now, before we get to those again, we're going to thank the sponsor of today's episode as I go and count my $8 winnings from the lotto, our friends at Miracle Made. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, 
Miracle Made. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so that you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. When they arrived at our house, my wife Anne loved to feel them so much, she couldn't even wait for me to get home to put them on our bed. Miracle Made has self cleaning. These sheets are infused with silver that prevents up to 99.7 of bacterial growth leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. Miracle Sheets also have incredible comfort and quality. Miracle Sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. So go to TryMiracle, that's T-R-Y-M-I-R-A-C-L-E dot com slash Campia to try Miracle Made Sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40% and if you use our promo code CAMPIA at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to TryMiracle.com slash CAMPIA and use the code CAMPIA to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's TryMiracle.com slash CAMPIA to treat yourself. And thank you to our friends at Miracle Made for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. 100% guys, you should go check them out. And I've been loving these things. <clears throat> you should give them a try. Check for the link down in the description below. All right. With that down, guys, let's get to the most important part of the show, which is you. What do you guys want to talk about? Jonathan, what we got up here first? All right. Well, my voice kind of went out, too. Ooh, let me change the camera here. Ooh, here I am. All right. <clears throat> first up, we got Inalo who says, uh, would you say that McGregor's character Knox was obnoxious? Obnoxious? You know what? <laughs> the joke would have been better if you didn't say the name first. If you just said, would you say that Conor McGregor's character was obnoxious? obnoxious? Instead of saying, would you say that his character Knox <clears throat> was uh, obnoxious? A little, little comedy writing lesson there for you. I must say, I like this Roadhouse movie way more than you should. Than I should. I, I watched I, it I three do. times. <laughs> I've watched this thing three times already. One with the neighbors. It's just. It, it just feels like a '90s like kind of a knockoff. It's I don't a. Know. It's a. It's a silly. You know, unabashedly just kind of fun little movie. And <laughs> I hate to say it, but I just like throughout the the viewings, I'm like, when Connor gets there. That's when the movie kind of turns up for me. <laughs> it does. I man, the man is entertaining. Hey, I can't, you I fellas, can't... hope hey. you're having a smashing good time. <laughs> Your father hired me, like and this. I like, always get a job done. When Knox is on the job, it's over, baby. I walk like this, baby. <laughs> you know, I've watched Three Body Problem twice now. Come on, the whole series. I'm... Yeah, you did a complete watch through twice <laughs> in like three days. I gotta get on that. Like you, you're talking. I've been hearing a number of people talking really highly yeah, about I'm it. I gotta get on, one. start watching. You started watching it too, right, Ray? Yeah, I finished episode one. How have you started watching it and I haven't yet? Well, I got, I gotta get on know. that. All right, what's next? I have no life. <laughs> Chris Miner says, uh, "Saw the menu since oh, the first yeah. time in theaters. It still holds up incredibly well. Great message about people taking the food service industry for granted." And I forgot how hilarious it is, uh, Tyler's BS. That movie's fantastic. It I really is. It and I thought it was supposed to be more of a thriller, but apparently not. No, I mean, it, and I don't know that the message of the movie is about how we treat the service industry people. I, I think the message of the movie is a lot deeper than that. Burgers, baby. But it's about burgers. <laughs> the goodness of burgers. I'll tell you what, man. I love that movie. That Anya Taylor-Joy, uh, the dude... The dude uh, who plays Beast and he's the yeah, new yeah, Lex uh, Luthor. Uh, um, who's about a boy. And, uh, Nicholas Holt. Nicholas Holt and yes. about a boy. About a boy. Um, he's the boy. It, and of course, the greatest actor in the world who doesn't have an Academy Award, Ray Fiennes, uh, who kills it in this movie. I still can't believe Ray Fiennes doesn't have an Academy Award. Well, it and is boring movies. There's he's no, so boring. There's no I, fighting. But I, I mean, what really, first of all, I was loving the movie already, right? And then it gets to the end. And there's something so brilliant about the simplicity. It's so simple, it goes over a lot of people's heads. Like, that is what? Because he ate a burger, he just lets her go? No, no. You, when she was sneaking around in his residence, 
She realized all these pictures of all the accolades and all the honors that he has won, he always looked miserable in all the pictures. And the only picture she found of him where he looked happy was a picture when he was much younger working in a burger place making burgers. And, she, and that stuck with her, that that's the only time this miserable guy ever looked happy. And so when he's about to kill her and, and you know, gives, gives the ultimatum, like, uh, you get one last meal, she goes, I'll take a cheeseburger. And then as he's making the burger and you see this joy coming over him again as do it. And anyway, I just thought it was like so great, so wonderful. It's just a, it's just a great movie. hundred percent. All right. I'm glad you watched it again. What's next? Uh, Tim says, uh, sorry, let me scroll this down. Uh, in my town in New Jersey <clears throat> was the winner of the mega millions. Damn it. Should have been me with that 1.13 billion. Well, I was also one of the winners. Just, yeah, just, he took just, eight dollars off of that. Just to so. be clear, yeah, I have to knock a few dollars <clears throat> off. I, you know, here's the funny thing too: is is that nobody's going to win the one point one three billion because no one's going to take the one point one three billion. Because what they do is they have this offer: you can take X number of dollars per year over the course of however many years. It's a lot of years, or you can take five hundred and fifteen million dollar straight check. Right? Is that away. what it was? Five fifteen. I think it was five fifteen. And then that's taxed. Oh yeah, well, yeah. it's all the gonna be taxed. Gonna be taxed. But the five fifteens yeah. taxed yeah. all at once. So, but yeah. still, you can take X amount of money for the next fifty years, or however many years they break it up over, right. or you 20. can take one big check right now. Yeah, I would easily take the one big check. Well, you know what? I used to, from a tax perspective, I used to say, "Oh, you take you take it over time because you're charged less tax wise." But when you when you uh, take into consideration inflation you actually are losing money if you take it over the 20 years yeah even despite tax against the, the lump sum so, there so you go. here's an interesting thing even if you took i did a little bit of math when i was figuring this out let's say you get the uh 500 million say take off half for taxes 250 million Ann and I talked about this. I told we made all the plans oh, for winning. Plans. We made all, made all. We sat plans. down. We all. planned out all what we plans. were going to do with this money, right? You're planners. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we planners. Schemers. So what we're going to do is okay. We're just instantly just 250 million off for taxes. We're going to give each one of our siblings a million bucks. Just a million. Each, each one. Yeah. yeah. Fuck them. They yeah, didn't win it. Them. We would give each one of our siblings a million dollars. Each one of our siblings and parents a million dollars each. Then we would take, that would leave about 30 million, uh, like 230 million, I mean. And so then we would just do whatever we wanted to do with the 30 million. And then we were going to take 200 million and put it in a 5% yield savings account. Do you know how much money you would make per month? Just know. putting 200 million in a 5% well, savings you'd have account? To 5%, that, uh, that's you'd have 10. To that'd be what 10 million it's a year. more than that because you also you're compounding yeah you're, so you're getting interest on top of the interest you just got but just just but just on a flat monthly yeah. right eight hundred and thirty three thousand dollars a month you would be making that's a lot of hot interest. toys that's a lot of hot toys that, and, and hot maja toys. cases so that's with that's that's like that's getting an eight hundred and thirty three thousand dollar check every month and never touching that 200 million and but you're right if jonathan it would then start to compound because mm -hmm. after two months you'd have Two hundred and one point six million dollars, and then you'd have like, oh, all the plans I made, Rob. And oh, then I took go my make phone. Movies. I took my phone and scanned the ticket, ready for it to tell me I was a winner, and it told me I was a winner of eight dollars. How to change so, uh, my plans a little? Now bit. let me ask you this, John: If you knew that they were going to announce your name publicly, because some states allow you to not reveal your name. Yeah, I think California, you don't have to have your name revealed. Uh, yeah, because I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't either. And I wouldn't move right away either. No, but there would be signs. There would be signs that I won. For example. Yeah. You'd say it on this show. No. <laughs> but I start showing up to work a lot less frequently. Yeah, but I Line mean. number one. <laughs> you got to look everything. All the lessons you need to know. Look what happened in Goodfellas when they the Lutanza heist. They pull it off. Someone goes and buys a pink Cadillac mm. and then mink coats. You don't do that. Yep. You lay low, you don't change anything until people forgot about that and wait till the next big winner comes But you know along. what the biggest sign would be that I won? Because I told you I'd be given a million dollars to each of my siblings. Ray would have like 
two full-time masseuses behind him oh, yeah. all show Tra just oh, wearing trench coat and yeah. raised shoulders Hurry up and win already Jeez. he'd be pulling fredos in vegas <laughs> wearing trench coats cocktail wearing, two at wearing a time. trench coats two masseuses in trench coats yeah. rubbing raised shoulders all all day and underneath more clothes <laughs> more, more trench coats and the, the, this, the, the whole tenor of the show would just change it would day. completely change it would totally yeah, change. Would burn that, up though. the youtube charts man mr beast Some, would have nothing on us king daddy goat in the live chat says ray would have two big hats <laughs> That would be the big that'd be the big giveaway. Ray with his second big hat. <laughs> All right. What's yeah, next? That's pretty good, man. All right. Um I'll give you that. Matt Boyle says Feige and Iger, the new Empire. Oh, Feige X Iger. Yeah. I'm telling you what, I have now that Chapex has gone, Iger has his power back, or uh uh Feige has his power back and all this kind of stuff. I I fully expect might not, possible that it won't, but I fully expect to see marvel get back to their winning ways let's say that uh of course we won't really know until oh gosh even even captain america 4 got initiated under the mandates of chapek but as soon as Iger got his power back they scrapped a lot of captain america 4 and went back and was doing a whole ton of reshooting to make it the movie he wanted it to be same thing happened with daredevil like <clears throat> we just had that mandate uh, from Chapek, make as much as you can, as fast as you can. We got to get it out to blah, blah, blah. And as soon as Feige got his power back, you know what we're doing? We're scrapping everything we shot with Daredevil and we're going to make it the way I want it made. So it's it's going to be interesting over the next year or two to see if they can start to get that ship back on course. We'll, we'll see. see what, uh, I, I think that uh, Deadpool and Wolverine <clears throat> is from a business standpoint going to be one of the most interesting releases of this year to see where they're going. And listen, I, I have no problem saying... The D Deadpool 3 is going to be the most important movie they've put out since Endgame because oh, they need this to be really good. 100%. It doesn't have to be a billion dollar film, although it will be a billion dollar film, but it doesn't have to make a billion dollars, but it's got to have everybody love it. Everybody's got to love it. And, and it's really important that they do that. Anyway. All right. What's next? All right. Uh, YT Pump Life, although you forgot to say over under what amount, but over under Godzilla X Kong opens to 75 mil. Either way, I say not. No, no, no. I see, I can see 50, 55. It's not going to make 75 million opening weekend. Rob? If it's good, but I don't think it's going to. But if it's really good, if it, it you know, I read the early reactions were, uh, they were encouraging. Yes, they were. They were, but I, I just think, un un unfortunately, I mean, maybe you're going to ride that Godzilla minus one train into the station, and but it, nobody it could... saw Godzilla minus one. That's true. <laughs> so I mean, that doesn't really. But a hundred, a hundred million people, a hundred million dollars, it did okay. Yes, a hundred million dollars worldwide, overall in its entire run. Yeah. I, I they're not all going to rush out opening weekend. To see I don't know, man. We'll see. I I don't think seventy five. I'm, I'm thinking fifty. I I, I just want listen, it to be good. If it's fifty, that makes it bigger than the last one's launch. Yeah, yeah. And I'm I think they like got to take. I think that's a big win for them if they can make this movie. And if it does open to fifty, I mentioned this the other day. That'll make four movies in March that all open to forty five million dollars or more. I know, which would be huge. If big, they can big, do that. big. All right. What's next? Yeah. All right. Uh, Arun says. How oh, by the way, oh, uh -huh, go ahead. So, right. what was, uh, what am I looking at? Oh, fifty dollars. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, let's yeah, not yeah. let's not go over the guy who super chatted in fifty bucks. Yeah, well, thank you, know. you, Kevin, so much, man, when for you supporting that level. Million earning five percent, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, very pumped for Timothy, phenomenal actor. Could we see him in the DCU? Also, thank you guys for always being awesome. Bring on filthy. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, we could we could totally see him in the DCU. <clears throat> what do you think he's gonna play? Oh, I mean that. There's, there's very little he couldn't oh, play. I mean, it's easy. It's the Mad Hatter. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's already kind of done it. Yeah. I mean, I could see Timothy Chalamet as a Riddler. Um, I could see him as an older Tim Drake. Oh. Um. Yeah. So, so what, what, are you what saying Tim Drake go on to be? He, he could also be a great Terry McGinnis. Yes, he can. Uh, yeah, you know what? That's true. Yeah, no, Timmy McGinnis. He won't sign up for doomed, never going to happen projects. <laughs> uh, I can see it was, who does Tim Drake be? He becomes Red Robin. That's Red, right. yeah. He becomes Red, 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 Red Robin. Yeah. Red Which, Robin. by the way, is one Red of the Robin. dumbest names ever in DC Comics. No, I'm not Robin anymore. 
I'm Red Robin. That's no, not... it's Red Hood. No, it's not Red Hood. Oh, that, it's not. That was it's Jason Todd. Todd. Yeah, sorry, Jason sorry. Todd. Yeah, Jason Todd was Red Hood. But I mean, yeah, I could see him as as a lot of different guys. I mean, look, obviously, I don't see Timothy Chalamet as Batman. Uh, I Batman's don't... right arm. <laughs> Maybe Batman's arm. That's that's about it. All right, what's next? And by uh, the way, thank you again, Kevin, for supporting us on that level, man. That's incredibly generous of you. Thanks, dude. Uh, now we have Arun who says, how does tickets uh, you win in a promotion help box office? Will the agencies purchase the tickets at a uh, rate as usual for actual tickets prices, or are they high? Or wait, I, I don't think it does. Look, tickets won in promotions will make up 0.0001% of the amount of seats taken up in a place. So it'll either be, number one, they're just written off as a marketing expense. Yeah. Number two, maybe a radio station buys out a theater and that will go. But we're talking about such a minuscule uh, amount of the thing that it's actually irrelevant how they count it. So I, I wouldn't worry about it. All right, what's next? All right, we got Dino Vader who says, the latest episode of Shogun was great, especially yep. the scene in the brothel. Yep. Just listening to the conversation, Gabe <laughs> yep. got excited. <laughs> I haven't heard that word in a long time. Dippy, haven't heard that one in a long time. Listen, but one of the great things about Shogun is it's not just these badass dudes and like I'm like just with their swords and one, <laughs> but you can have these scenes. Like the last episode was one of my favorite scenes of television I've seen in a while, where it was just the four people kneeling at a dinner table drinking sake and talking and it was sake. some of the most intense <laughs> awesome dramatic stuff like i was so... and then they got onto this episode first of all there's a ton of stuff what is it the re the crimson flood the crimson tide no that's alabama the but the crimson flood or something like that they're talking about all that kind of stuff and you know you got tora nagasama's like i never wanted to be shogun but now the air must be protected and i will do like just like yeah but they got this scene where Cosmo, uh, John Blackthorne, he, he's given a gift by the Lord Regent Toranaga, the gift of the finest courtesan in the land. I, I mean, I've never got that gift, but so he gets given this gift. He's, I'm, I, he, and he says to Mariko, the girl, he says, take him to the, like, basically the best little whorehouse in Osaka. Take him to the best, you know, courtesan we have in the land and you go with him. <laughs> he says to her, you go with him. Uh, translate, you know, so um, when, I mean, that was a strange thing. So Left when a little. When they're pillowing, <laughs> translate hell? for him because he doesn't speak Japanese, right? And then the courtesan, the way the courtesan, first of all, that's Shakespearean. The dialogue of the courtesan was was uh, amazing. But also, like I said, she's basically trying to talk Mariko and having a threesome and they're like, me and me were like, yeah, do it. But no. Anyway, fabulous show. Best oh, thing on television show. right now. <laughs> Best, it's best, awesome. best thing on television right now. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. All right. What's next? TJ Perry says Sydney Sweeney's Immaculate was actually great. Yeah, I never did see it. Oh, it just opened last week. Yeah, I, I, I did not. Get, you know, I've, I haven't even seen a promotion or a trailer for it or anything. I, I've read reports, but I've, I'm not really seeing anything from it at all. Nuns in trouble. Always a good genre. <laughs> Nun exploitation. Nuns in trouble. Always a good thing. Nun exploitation. All right. What's next? Matan says. The Disney Plus color changes sucks. Huh. It became more sterile and identity less. Uh, the Manda Mando season three and some of Marvel shows. Hey oh, because he doesn't like the color scheme. Yeah. So, why is this even remotely important? A lot of people hate changes. <laughs> yeah. Th th okay. Look, that is a hundred percent true. So, for those who don't know, the Disney Plus logo had some very slight changes of the color scheme and in the swooshing thing that goes over the top of Disney plus it used to have a color gradient in it. Now it's a solid color. It's extremely minor. See if you can find a, a picture of the, of uh, that uh, Jonathan about the Disney plus logo change. Okay. I it's, like that little, the little piece of music though. The, oh yeah. Click. I, but here's the thing. I remember I saw the logo and I didn't even know it was a change okay, so here. until you know, the article pointed out, oh, they've changed it from this to this. I kind of like the green. I don't know. Yeah, so so the one on the left, the blue one, is what Disney Plus's logo has been. The new logo uh, has more of a Hulu color to yeah, it. because it has that Hulu gradient added to it. Yeah. yeah so, I think that'll be temporary. 
think the, so? Yeah, because it looks like somebody in France color timed it wrong. <laughs> well, uh, Studio Canal looks like that when they were color timing Basic Instinct that they went to orange and teal. Yeah, but ultimately, there's not really any change. I like the gradient though. The background color is different, and the swoosh to the plus doesn't have a gradient in it. I, I, I honestly, like I said, when I first looked at it, I didn't even know it was different. I was like, oh you yeah, know, I guess it's, it's like Google changing their logo for Thanksgiving. Yeah, I, they'll, I, they'll you know, but we, I, yeah, I you, don't think you it's remember important. there were times like on AMC Movie Talk, we'd make some kind of like visual change, dude, and people would be like, <laughs> I don't even know if I can watch anymore. Like seriously, I kid you not. I kid you. Dennis and I used to talk about this yeah. all the time. We do AMC Movie Talk, and it's like one of the co- we we changed like a color on one of the back screens. Yeah, and, like, and oh. John, Jonathan's not exaggerating, guys. We literally would get messages from people. I don't. I'm not going to watch anymore. I don't know if I like. You could just what? You didn't even ask us, the audience. Do you disrespect us so much? You didn't consult us first about changes you're making to the show. It's literally a different color on the screen behind us. It had, like, and but I have learned this all the way back from my movie blog days. I'd make a slight different, like a change on the movie blog to the header graphic, and like people saying, oh, "I don't know if I can come to the site anymore." Like it's like. <laughs> Online. I mean, it's true in life. It's true in life. But online especially. People do not like change. No. They don't like change. And then here's the funny thing. I already know where it's going. When you do make the change, right, that everybody says will ruin you if you make this change, you do make the change. Then a year later, if you change away from that, yep. they'll complain that you can't change away from this. Yeah. This thing that they said a year earlier was going to ruin you. Yeah. Now they absolutely don't want you. But that's us. Listen, I'm guilty of it too. Everybody's guilty of it. It's a part of Especially our human Ray. nature. Yeah. We do not like change no matter how micro the change is. We it, it, it just rubs us the wrong way sometimes. But then we adapt to it and we fall in love with it. And then we never want to change from that. that is, it's just different. Yeah. All right, what's next? All right, uh, we got Johnny Got Lost. Uh, A hilarious moment online hate. Oh, okay. A hilarious moment in online hate was when people shit on the CGI giraffe (laughs) in Last of Us only for it to turn out to be the real (laughs) giraffe. I I remember that so. First of all, remember watching that episode of Last of Us with the giraffe, which is a beautiful moment. It's kind of breathtaking. Almost Jurassic Mm Park-ish, right? It's a beautiful moment. And then I remember the first time I heard somebody say, well, it was CGI. I'm, oh, really? That was CGI? Holy crap. I thought that looked great. But a lot of people online, oh, that looked like bullshit. That, that was terrible. Why did they use CGI? Oh, you could just tell it was so badly done, blah, blah, blah. And then like show people like, uh, here's photos from the set. It, no, it was a real giraffe. It was not CGI. It's one of the craziest things ever. <laughs> one of the absolute craziest things well, ever. The worst real giraffe ever. Yeah. yeah, we're a stupid giraffe. Yeah. That giraffe is woke. Should have been more realer. <laughs> All right, what's next? Manuel says, uh, critics aside, movies that actually OMG'd the world. The arrival of a train, Ben-Hur, episode four, um, Tron. I don't know if Tron really had that big of a... Uh, not when it came out. Not when it came out. Terminator 2, Jurassic Park, episode one, uh, Avatar, Avatar 2, and three made by a Canadian. How proud are you? How can you three miss... made by a Canadian? I'm with How can you miss Star Wars? Well, he ignored episode four. Oh, he did. Oh, you're right. Yeah, okay. But four. it wasn't episode four when it came out. No, no, no. no. Um, Just saying. First, of all, always proud of of the great Canadian filmmakers. Again, two of the best out there right now are Canadian filmmakers with James Cameron and uh, Denis Villeneuve. It's one of the hottest stars in the world. Well, two of the hottest stars in the world right now are both Canadians: the Ryan's Gosling and uh, Reynolds, obviously. Um, yeah, I remember once a bunch of years ago, uh, the CBC, that's the main network in Canada, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is called the CBC. They did this mockumentary before mockumentaries were cool. They did a mockumentary when I was a kid about the secret they've uncovered that the CBC news team has uncovered the secret plot by Canada to take over America through the entertainment industry wow and that was the mockumentary where i found out that william shatner was canadian i didn't even know william (laughs) shatner was canadian i didn't know lauren green was canadian i like like a lot of like and they they did all these things where and then they had an ann murray i mean 
Anne Marie's almost almost before my time, so she's before a lot of years' time. But they like we took Anne Murray's record, one of her big hits, and we played it backwards. American surrender, you will fall before us, and all this kind of stuff. It it was great. But yes, always really really proud of whenever I get to see uh, fellow Canadians doing great stuff in the business. All right, what's next? Uh, we got Raymond Verado who says. Um... Timothy as Bob Dylan and now Jeremy Allen White and talks to play the boss. That would be Bruce Springsteen in the biopic Deliver Me From Nowhere. Uh, could they play twins or face off? <laughs> <laughs> that first of all, how good is Jeremy Allen White? He's great. Like, like every time you see like a new face that you because I was not familiar with Jeremy Allen White at all prior you to You know he's Gene Wilder's grandson? No, that's a that's a that's a myth. That was it debunked. is? Yeah, it was debunked. Was oh, it was debunked? Because yeah. as soon as you said it's like, oh my God, how did I not notice that before? But I Looks didn't exactly notice him. Like him. I didn't I know. know him from anything before the bear, right? And you never know if somebody is just a one-hit wonder. Like remember John Heater in Napoleon Dynamite and everybody thought he was the next big thing. Turns out he was not. But I mean, then he comes out and he does the uh, the, the the wrestling one with Zach. Efron. What's yeah. the name of that one again? Uh, Iron Claw. Iron Claw. The Iron Claw. And you realize, oh my God, this guy's good. Well, Shameless. Oh, I forgot that He's was incredible. him in Shameless. He was in I Shameless for like a million seasons. He's so. I didn't watch that until recently, and Elizabeth was watching. I got sucked right William in. William H. Macy. He yeah, started that, that show first is season. Great. Yeah, that show was really good until the last. I season. totally forgot about that. But yeah, he is. He's going to be big. He's great. Yeah, he's so good. All right, what's next? Uh, we got. Uh, Gopala says the future of the X Men. Uh, no, the future of the MCU: X Men, F Four, Spider Man. Well, the near future. X Men will be a part of the future. Fantastic Four will be part of the future. Mm -hmm. Um, but listen, there's something I, I think that we all need to kind of calibrate with, and keep in mind. Nobody seems to care about Fantastic Four. Yeah. Uh, sorry. They're going to have to make us care. Yeah. they The MCU is in a position where they need... I, that's the pe perfect way to put it, Rob. The MCU has to make people care about them because they've made a lot of Fantastic Four movies and nobody went to go see them and the ones that did hated them and it kind of hurt it more. Nobody bought the comic books anymore. Like, I still remember us doing the big story about it when they canceled the final thing. of, And they've done re revivals and everything. But they, I remember when they canceled the Fantastic Four comic, like, they put out the numbers, like, of how many issues they were selling. And we realized, holy shit, more people, this is back in the AMC days, more people are watching Mailbag than buying Fantastic Four comics. That's yeah. not good. Well, the Fantastic and Four are not cool. They're, they're, yeah. they're a throwback to an earlier era. And the idea of a family, even though Ben Grimm, you know, a family is not necessarily... What they're going to do is, I think, by setting them in the 60s and bringing them forward to today, I think that's going to make them cool. I think we're going to see a cool factor that they haven't had because the, the Tim Story Fantastic Four movies at Fox were so... They play them, like, so straight and earnest, and they weren't... They were kind of... Milk toast. This is it. This is it, though. I, I mean, yeah, you're, you're right. This is it. I mean, you, if they can't make Fantastic Four work now, no one's going to try another iteration for yeah. a very, very long time. And then as far as the X-Men go, well, I mean, listen, other than Wolverine and like maybe Professor X, talk to 100 people coming in out of, out of an average movie theater sometime and say, name three X-Men. What percentage of those random 100 people do you think will actually be able to name three X-Men that aren't Wolverine or maybe Professor X? I don't know. So I, I definitely, the mutants are definitely going to be a part of that MCU future. Fantastic Four will be a part of that future. But I, I hear a lot of my fellow fans going, no, they are the future. They're, we're the future, Charles, not, not them. them. <laughs> I, I, but I don't know that I buy it. I, I mean, I, we'll see. I, I'm with we'll you see. because, again, the X-Men... 20 years of X-Men movies, 24 years now. And uh, I don't necessarily think that the, the X-Men have been hit and miss the same way that Fantastic Four were hit and miss. By the way, I see a bunch of our viewers writing a bunch of names of X-Men. 
you're not the average person coming out of right. a movie theater. Like uh, those of us who make and watch this show, of course, we, you guys at home and us, we can name them. We're the choir. But I'm, yeah, we're the, that's the perfect way of putting it, Jonathan. We're the choir. We ain't the congregation. I'm just telling you, you ask random average people out there, name three X-Men that's not Wolverine or, or Professor X. I, I don't think you're going to get, obviously some of them will. I don't think you're going to get a huge percentage that are able to do it. <laughs> no one wants to get beat up. <laughs> Nobody wants to get beat up. <laughs> name three X-Men. Oh, <laughs> we got him. We got him. Yeah. We need to know if we need to beat you it's up or not. It's a trick question. Well, nerd, don't fall for it. Buddy. Just name two. Nerd. Name two and drive away. That's it. <laughs> There's guys out there all walking, bullying people in cars. <laughs> name three X-Men, bro. <laughs> all right. What's next? All right, we got uh, Raymond who says, you're still here, John. Another guy won the lotto. Uh, not all of it. I am. A p that's right. Yeah. I got eight of those dollars, my friend. Yeah. The, eight best eight of, dollars. The, the best $8. The best $8. Yep, the straightest, most crispy. <laughs> Which was essentially a partial refund of your yeah, tickets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight that's, times I can do that. Yeah. Eight well, times. Well, depending. All right, depending what's on next? how many stick together. <laughs> we got what? We got Jonathan Hunthy who says, happy 14th birthday to my awesome son, Logan. Oh, happy Aww. birthday to your son, man. That's awesome. All right. What's All next? All right. We Named got... after an X-Men. That's that's right. There's somebody. Well, again, One more, Rob. the X-Men or you Wolverine doesn't count. <laughs> At Wolverine doesn't count. Or a Sandman. Some man. Some man. Sure. Uh, we got Kevin Irving with $100. Oh, oh my oh, God. Chat. Thank you, Kevin. for oh. Holy yeah. crap. Thank you, dude, mm. for supporting us on that Lottery level, man. Here. Oh, he won. <laughs> yeah, uh, Kevin I, won the lottery. He won the lottery. You live in New Jersey, Kevin? <laughs> Add another couple of zeros on that, you cheap son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> you billionaire. Uh, all right, what's next? I want to think. Got? Well, I want to thank you all for always putting a smile on my face, especially on days when I need it the most. Question, quick question for Ray. WWE is firing on all cylinders right now. What do you think of The Rock and everything he's doing right now heading into WrestleMania? I, I'm telling you, did, did you see what happened on? The I no, I haven't watched anything. Not a thing. That kind of took me for a swerve. I have no idea what's going to happen. Anymore. Wait, you got to set it up. What happened? Well, Rock beat the crap out of Cody Rhodes. Well, beat the crap out of him. Like fake beat blood. The crap out of him, because know. because my whole angle was the Rock. He's the Rock. He's gonna Listen, you know. The Rock was always the best when he was a heel. He's gonna turn. He was always best. He's when gonna he was turn a heel. on Roman Reigns. I think a lot of us were thinking that could be an angle, and that's how Cody would win the title. But now he's full blown. All in. I have no idea what's going to happen. I saw a headline, okay, in an entertainment, not a not a uh, wrestling outlet, a, a big entertainment outlet, a headline that read, and I didn't read the article, and I, now I want to actually look it up and maybe find it, but the, basically the headline was this, and I might get a couple of the words wrong, but it's like, The Rock, basically the headline was, The Rock has is so good right now in his return, it's causing problems for WrestleMania. <laughs> like it's like they're saying i don't think the wwe i don't think anybody understood how good the rock would be in his return and they're saying it's causing problems he's so good because now it's making them second like again i don't know because i'm not reading it or watching it but Put it this way like no one's talking about cody against roman anymore i think all of us now want to see the rock versus cody right which and is a complete 180 well, 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 From what it was a few weeks ago, I was like, fuck The Rock. All credit the wrestling the fans were like, credit to the rock. the rock. Credit to him uh, getting under people's nerves. <laughs> yep. But again, he was always best as a heel. He yeah, was yeah. the coolest and at his absolute best yeah. as a heel. He was so good. Well, I hope he, he enjoys WrestleMania. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I hope guy, he has a good time. Yeah. Enjoy All right, it, man. And you know what? He need Listen, Rock is one of my favorite movie stars. I love Rock. But after everything with Black Adam and like then some of the work came out about what was going on behind the scenes of Black Adam that he was actually trying to angle to take over DC and all this kind of stuff, his image both as franchise Viagra and his image of just the nicest guy in the room. And by the way, I have sat down with Dwayne Johnson on a number of occasions. He is the nicest guy in the room. But his image on both those fronts took a pretty big hit and people I think have looked at him a little bit different in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. And I think this return to WWE and apparently kicking that much ass and all of a sudden now everybody loves The Rock again is probably a pretty brilliant you, move. His hot toy came out. Have you seen his entrance? Which one? This Black oh, Adam the hot Black toy. Black Adam one? Do you have it? No. 
Okay, I'm gonna get it though. I can look up pictures. Have you seen, seen his new entrance? It's no. Pretty cool. So now there's lightning comes and it's all dark, and then he peers like it's black. And like he's, he's black Adam. There, like he's black Adam. It looks he's so. Like, I'm cool. gonna own it one way. So another. corny. That's but it actually, looks so cool. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna have to look that up. I'm gonna look that up when we're done. All right. <laughs> What's next? And by the way, and thank you again, man, for uh, yes, for uh, supporting us, man. So cool of you. All right. What's next? All right. Dallas Hall says, uh, "Will the MJ biopic make more than Bohemian Rhapsody's 910? Hell no. I no. didn't realize that it almost made a billion. Bohemian. Yeah, that made that movie made a lot of money. Listen, there's just too many people. Uh, yeah. I don't Here's, think so. This is going to be the problem. I'm not saying it's not going to make money. I, I think it can make money. But there are going to be a lot of people who simply are going to refuse to see this movie mm. because it doesn't call Michael Jackson a child molester. I'm not saying he was, but I'm saying there are a lot of people who believe he was. And they, we already started hearing people objecting to this movie. That it's whitewashing the the uh, the reputation, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. Well, we'll. But no, I don't. I don't see the movie making anywhere near nine hundred million. It also dollars. depends on the quality. Because all I have stuck in my head is that nineteen nineties made for TV biopic, The Jacksons. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but I it's, it's Anton myself, Fuqua. But... Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, Antoine Fuqua's last movie, Emancipation, didn't do all that well. I mean. A I love Antoine. He, he's a great filmmaker, but not, it's not like all of his movies crush. I can box watch office. Training Day and Olympus Has Fallen yeah. on an endless loop. Yep. <laughs> all right. What's next? All right. Uh, Kyle McComb says, highly recommend the Polish animated movie The Peasants in theaters right now, and each frame is a beautiful oil painting. Yeah. I'm trying to watch it uh, again tonight. I'm not familiar with it. I've heard that. it was. It's like like he said, a beautiful oil painting. I've heard it's incredible. Wow but I haven't seen it. I, I love it when our viewers write in stuff like this, because yeah. not only are we getting introduced to, to things, but like everybody else watching the show is now hearing about this. So thanks for throwing that in there, man. All right, what's next? Uh, Anzio Hall says, um, hey, crew, my birth my birthday's today. Excited for G.I. Joe. Happy birthday, man. And and listen, I'm, again, I, I don't know what Paramount is thinking. I don't think you can do more. G I don't think any G.I. Joe is going to be successful. Unless they do that paradigm shift where they go from like, you know what? We're not going to worry about the toys. Let's break. Let's worry about making badass movies and then the toys will follow. Not making a movie to sell toys, but making a great movie to make a great movie. And then the natural outflow of that is selling toys. I, I don't know. We'll see. I will do. say, speaking of the toys, the new G.I. Joe's, they're considered, they're called G.I. Joe classified. They are way better toys than I've not the seen them before. I haven't either. They're, they're a little bit bigger. They come with a lot of stuff. I mean, mm. it's it's very popular. Are they six inch like the Black Series Star Wars? Yeah, Star yeah. Wars they're series? exactly like the Black Series Star Wars. That's right. cool. Yep. Well, What's next? Vixter says. Vixter. Uh, yeah. Uh, with one episode left, the Walking Dead spinoff with Rick and uh, Michonne. Yeah. Uh, Reunited has been some of the best TV I've seen in ages. Superb writing and directing. Wait a second. Rick Grimes is back? Yeah, yeah dude. He's one of the survivors. Okay. Look at John. <laughs> I might need to watch this. <laughs> I, I love Rick Grimes. Trust Vixter's got I great taste. Grimes, I, I, no doubt. Listen, I know a lot of people who, who love Walking Dead. But I tapped out. I mean, I, I enjoyed Walking Dead. I did. And then somewhere around season five or six, I'm like, yeah, okay. I, did I'm, you watch the Daryl miniseries when he's nope, in Europe? I saw that too. I, didn't, saw, I didn't see I that. Right. I didn't see Fear of the Walking Dead. I didn't see Have Ice Cream with The Walking Dead. I didn't see, you know, I didn't see any of it. I, I just, after about five or six seasons, I'm like, okay, I'm good. This is all basically now just kind of the same. And I, and it was good while I watched it and I enjoyed it, but yeah, I, I kind of tapped out. Oh, but my. I still know a number of people still really like it. I've yeah. heard them, like uh, they did also another spinoff, right? With the girl and uh, the guy with the baseball bat, Negan. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah what was that called oh walking dead something Maggie city? And, uh, dead city, city or something i don't know something like oh, that boy. fear the walk not fear the walking dead yeah so i mean that, I'm, I'm happy i'm happy for them i just i had enough i watched they're a lot milking, of it and i was good on it they're milking the teat they're, they're milking the teat Every as it teat, were it i just don't understand how <laughs> these walking dead haven't deteriorated you know, after a while, they, they just fall apart. They, fall would, apart. they would just well, disintegrate. Well, here's what really kills me. One forever. of the things that I learned this is new in, ones made. in Walking Dead is that killing the undead is surprisingly easy. Like, literally, I've seen, like, I ran out of times, the number of scenes I saw were 
Daryl and whoever he's with, oh no, there's 40 walkers around us. All right. And they just literally walk around the knife, stab in head, stab in head, mm-hmm. hit in head with baseball. And they come out unscathed. And they were thinking, how did these guys take over the world? Mm-hmm. Like one battalion of like 50 trained U.S. Marines with machine guns would have been able to take out hundreds of thousands of these things. Or just drive to Wyoming, the least populous state in the United States, and hang out there. You Imagine have the cardio, problem. too, that you get from stabbing <laughs> the their heads. Cardio. They're just getting stronger. So you know, go find Daddy Jeffrey Daddy. Starr's you know, llama uh, farm or wherever he lives. And, Again, you know. I am not crap-talking Walking Dead. I, I enjoyed it when I watch it. I just hit the point where I was like, okay, I've had enough. And so if you guys keep watching it, that's awesome. That's I, I hear they do some pretty good stuff. All right, what's next? Uh, Daniel Hernandez says, John, should I stop tripping acid when watching Shogun? I could have swore I saw Tom Cruise from the last name. <laughs> no, well, no, watch it again. He's in it. That's that happened. He's absolutely that was not there. the trip. Watch it there. again. No, there's a, there's a little time difference between The Last Samurai and Shogun. About 100 years, I think. Yeah, t- almost 200 years. Almost 200? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but my God, this show. <laughs> what kind of- this show so good. This Everyone show- needs a Marco oh. in their life. Guys, if you're not watching. Shogun. I, I saying, don't know what you're doing. You got to watch Shogun. It's so good. I thought you were about to say, if you're not dropping acid. <laughs> if you're not dropping acid, wait, you're making bad life choices. <laughs> Micro-dosing. Right. What's Micro-dosing. next? Micro-dosing. Well, he, if he's watching this show, it might help. <laughs> um, Mario says, Timothy should play the live-action Terry McGinnis. A- oh. oh. You know, it's almost Bravo, like someone- Mario. Yeah. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. The Can moment the money thing. The please? moment Timothy's like, you know what? I'm getting tired of making big hits. I want to make something that nobody's going to watch. Then yes, I'm sure he'll I find up immediately. I want to test my star power. Yeah, I really want to test my star power. <laughs> I want to test my star power. Yeah. All right, what's next? Uh, we got Eric Andre the Giant says, <laughs> "Who to electric poogaloo <laughs> has some amazing writing. I nearly wept when he said it's poo in time." <laughs> Looks like Dune 2 has some Oscar comp. All right, but here's the funny thing. You remember uh, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey um, had a 3% on Rotten Tomatoes. Okay. Right? I'm just got to bring it up here because I was kind of shocked when I saw this. Oh, did it go up? No, no. Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, the first movie, has a 3% Rotten Tomato rate. Okay. Nice. Look at the critic rating on the second one. Wow. 67%. That is a 64% improvement. You learn from your mistakes. Now, granted, that's only 15 reviews, and I'm sure one of them is Taylor's. He wrote all of them. He probably wrote, <laughs> wrote all of them. <laughs> no, I am. How do you do that? So he, so he gave some bad ones to bring it down to look real. Yeah, yeah uh, this movie is awesome. Taylor Gonzalez. Next, this movie is the best ever. Gaylor Tonzalez. Then this movie is whatever. Like, uh, yeah, it's probably I got all my hand stuck Taylor. in the honey pot. <laughs> Hey, there's an 83% on that other side, though. Yep, 83? Well, let's, let, let, let's be honest. Nobody went to go see Pooh, Blood, and Honey 2 that didn't like the first Pooh, Blood, and Honey, right? <laughs> no, like, nobody's going back. So I, I suspect any of the audience ratings on the second one will be positive. All right, what's next? But hey, again, that's a 64% improvement. Give credit where it's due. Paddington, watch out, man. Look out, Paddington. <laughs> Who's going to have the better third film? <laughs> All right, what's next? Uh, we got Lipstick Train Face with a $20. <laughs> with a $20. Um, Hello, Super Chat, thank, thank you, you. Lipstick. Uh, I tried getting my two-year-old to watch the last Godzilla Kong movie to see if he would be uh, interested in going to see the new one this weekend. He ignored it. Well, he's two. Uh, I put on the wiggles and he was captivated. What a loser. I know, I know. <laughs> Your kid sucks. <laughs> Try again. Try again. What are the, the wiggles? Take. Oh, sounds very. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, it's Kong and Godzilla is is for older. You yeah, know, and he's five, two? six, he's two? seven. You know, I mean, two is like, yeah, come on. Give him yeah, wiggles and yeah. bluey for now. We'll give your we'll give your kid a pass for now. Yeah. Give your kid a pass. But by age five, if he doesn't care about dinosaurs, oh then, yeah, then it's time for then, him to then, get a yeah. job or move out. Yeah, you show him Rodan. <laughs> the kids love Rodan. Did you see, by the way, the new international trailer for Godzilla X Kong with Mothra? No. Did yeah. you see it, Rob? Mosura. Do they have the Mothra song? Do they sing it? No, no, that was no. Too, but, it was but they actually show. How do you pronounce the name of the the creature? Shimu? Shim, Shim, Shimu, I guess. Shimo I, yeah. or Shimu, whatever. Shimu. So they've got they, in Timo. the new trailer you see at the top, Scar and Kong jumping at each other in the air, and below them you got Shimo and Godzilla jumping towards each other. 
uh, in which, the same which shot. Which John believes is in the movie. I believe that I believe it's is in not movie. in the movie. I think at it's all. in the movie, but it, just for the trailer, they didn't have finished like effects because they look pasted on. I'll, I'll tell you. The thing I'll, is, I'll go the Mothra twins show up. That's what I want to know. I don't think the, the song. twins show up, but but Moth, a glowing, that's a, a glowing Mothra shows further. up. Musula. Give us one step further. Go ahead. Okay, one step further. Yeah. Before they even had an idea for the movie, they thought of that shot. You know what would look cool? Kong and another giant monkey jumping at each other, and Godzilla and another kind of Godzilla jumping at each other. Cool. Let's write a movie. Do you I think, think they, they cross start. each other and take their nothing enemy is going to be cooler than Godzilla <laughs> King of the Monsters? It's as if man. they Come didn't on. see uh, No Way Home. Godzilla King of the Monsters was not good. Was awesome. Oh, oh and Mike Doherty killed it. Knocked it out of the park. Such a bad movie. There Knocked some it great out of the scenes park. Scenes in that movie though. There are some great. I, I'll give it great that. Scene. Brutal. There are a little great brutal. Scenes. Monster a man. A little brutal. There are but, some yeah. good scenes in that. All right. What's next? Okay. Okay. Uh, you didn't have to shoot a damn monkey. All right. Talking. Speaking of Godzilla here. Mr. Godzilla says, which do you think will have the bigger fallout from fans after they are released due to Messiah if it comes out or Last of Us Season 2? Or it might be Season 3. Now, yeah, that's the thing. I think it might be Season 3. It's it's going to be... Look, there are a lot of people... Most people are going to watch a show or not watching shows like ours on YouTube. It's going to be The Red Wedding. That whenever they do that, and I don't know if it's going to be in season two of Last of Us or not, but it's going to be the next Red Wedding. Yeah, and I think way it's going to have way, a way bigger impact because it's the overall story of Dune, Messiah, and people already see the seeds of that planted. So when I say Red Wedding, I mean The Last of Us. Yeah, yeah, but that's what I mean. But okay. the red, the la the Last of Us in the red, what happens in the Last of Us is like the Red Wedding. Yeah. It is unexpected. It happens quickly brutally and you're left with your jaw hanging open yeah whereas dune messiah is a slow build and they've already sent you by the end of dune 2 you know where it's going i think for me the most important thing that uh, last of us has to do this season if they're going to stretch it out is make me care about everyone else yeah in order to keep mm. watching right because if you that's, that's i think that's important. what they're i think that's what they're afraid of if they take pedro right away I'm not going to stay on probably. Like I don't care I, enough. Depending I don't on care how they enough do about it. the characters around. So, but see, that's yeah. the funny thing. I remember if you go back and watch a lot of the Red Wedding reaction videos, like a lot of them have like people crying and going, "Fuck this show! I'm not going to watch the show anymore." They kept watching. Yeah, they kept. They, they kept watching. Oh man, I I, I was um, like, I'm checked out, and then the very I I hate watched. I needed healing. I, need, so I, I needed I, I healing. The healed next the week. healing. <laughs> I came back the next week. All right, what's next? Still not healed. Um, Susie, indie music fan. I'm an indie music fan, too. If Bob Iger loses, uh, then I think uh, Kay Feige walks. I wouldn't blame him. I would go to Apple. It's my go-to streaming uh, uh, place. They're not afraid to experiment, and I think he would be given whatever he wants. Well, okay, first of all, you're right on both fronts. Uh, maybe not the Apple Plus part, but here's where you're right on both fronts. It'll go work for Gunn. Yeah. If... If Bob Iger loses this upcoming board battle that's going on, Kevin Feige's gone. And he's gone for two different reasons. Uh, number one, because he ain't going to put up with the bullshit he had to put up with the last couple nope. of years under JPEG anymore. Like he's, he's done. He's over that. Now, he'll finish out his contract, which is why I don't think he left while he was with, while JPEG was still there. But his contract has got to be coming up soon. Number two, if Nelson Peltz has any kind of a win, you know who the most powerful person at Disney is now going to be? Ike Perlmutter. Mm -hmm. Ike Perlmutter, who all fans hate for a reason and who Kevin Feige hates, is going to become probably the most powerful guy at Disney. Um, and, and Kevin Feige will just... So Perlmutter... You know Perlmutter's just been waiting to fire Kevin Feige. Perlmutter, ever since... Ever since Kevin Feige got him kicked out, he's been like way biding his time. He wants to keep. So for number one, Feige will absolutely want to leave. And number two, even if he didn't, which he does want, will want to leave. But even if he didn't, Ike Perlmutter is going to just find a way to get rid of him. Well, let me ask you this. I can't imagine a worse fate for Peltz's bid to win and Perlmutter to take over. Because who's going to run? D Disney will go right in the toilet. Well, oh yeah, you need you stock need... wise. I feel like this would be a massive sell off. So they, the the stockholders would literally be voting to completely devalue their shares. Right, right. I I mean it's it, it's a nightmare scenario if Iger doesn't succeed. Yeah, but I think now the second part is 
while I'm not sure it will be Apple, it, you remember when Disney fired James Gunn? What, the, the one mistake my all-time movie executive hero, Alan Horn, ever made was when they, they fired James Gunn initially. You remember what happened? Every studio in the town lined up at James Gunn's door, <clears throat> knocking on his door and saying, we'll let you do whatever you want. We'll give you whatever you want and we'll let you do whatever you want. And he ended up picking Warner Brothers and and going that way. And, and they literally, but that's what happened. Every single studio went to his door and it's going to be that times two. If Kevin Feige leaves Disney, Every studio is going to line up and offer him whatever he wants. You want to know what I hope, John? What's that? I hope this, if this happens, I hope that Kevin Feige goes to Paramount. And I'll tell you why. That would be awesome. You know what Kevin Feige loves? Star Trek. Yes, he does. And he would go there, and you know who else loves Star Trek? Steve Asbell, who's the current president of 20th Century Fox. They want a studio all, you know what's great? That he's like Coach Taylor in Friday Night Lights when the when the East Lions were created, and they went to start something because what does Kevin Feige get to do? He's already conquered the franchise. Now he's going to take a studio, a venerable studio that's responsible for the Godfather, Star Trek, Chinatown. All he can do is rehabilitate it, bring it up, and make it the most gigantic phoenix from the flames ever. Star Trek will never be that. No, I'm not. I'm saying, para, I'm <laughs> saying Paramount. Paramount. He's taking. Uh, he's he's talking about all the. I, I'm he, talking about the entire. He's the whole not going to go to Paramount just to take over a franchise. He's going to go to Paramount to be the head of the movie division. That's right. And yeah, he, overall, he, he yeah. doesn't want to go work for Apple. He wants to go to a movie studio and make it rise. He's going to turn Paramount into a juggernaut because he's going to do with one franchise. He's going to do it with an entire studio. But he, but here, but to your point, you go, Kevin Feige. If Apple, now I want pelts to win. Remember, I was saying I don't think it's going to be Apple. But if Apple, who has unlimited resources, went to a Kevin Feige. And said, we are going to give you carte blanche over all of Apple's entertainment division. You will have sole discretion over what projects we do, what we don't do, all that kind of stuff. And you are going to have our considerable resources behind you. I think even for Kevin Feige, that would be very tempting. It would be very, but you know what he would do? What's that? He would say, why don't you buy Paramount? Because here's the thing. Apple's cool. And you have all your money. That's great. Yeah, but if cool. you have the history and you have, Overrated. they have a studio lot. Paramount has a lot. They've got a water tower, and they need somebody like <laughs> a, a water, water tower. tower. I'm not kidding, man. The no, Warner right. Brothers. Why do you think tower. the Animaniacs? Where do they live? Well, that, that's the Warner, Warner Brothers. Brothers water that, tower in their water in tower. Water tower. Yeah. That's why Paramount has right a water there. tower. They've got a front oh. gate. They've There's got Melrose no Avenue. Is that where Tom Cruise's production office is in the water tower? Yeah, probably. I'm telling up there. you, they're gonna. That's what. That's the. That's the plan. You want history. That means Hollywood. You're at the center of Hollywood. Kevin Feige, I want pelts to you win now. The problem, just, just... Here's, here's the problem with that, though. <laughs> Apple would not... The problem is Paramount comes with a lot of pieces. Yeah. A lot of pieces that Apple wouldn't want. I know. And right now, that's the holdup because Paramount seems to be... The family in charge seems to be very hesitant to split up the company. Kevin Feige would keep it all. Hmm. He would keep it all make and make pitch. it all work because that would be the fun for him. He doesn't need to make another billion dollar grossing movie. What he needs to do is create an entertainment behemoth yeah. that can move forward in the 21st century. And I'll be all for it. I'll be all for it. Or he could retire and have, live a nice life. Or he could retire. He doesn't want to do that. And have, you know, trench coat wearing masseuses rubbing mm. his shoulders all day. He's going to take, he's going to go to take Robert Evans' old office. That would be awesome. He's going to set people Bubby. up in the Roddenberry building. He's going to bring all Star Trek production back to the Paramount lot where He's going to put everything on physical baby. media. He's going to put everything on He's going to have Rob do all the special features. All right, we got to keep going no. here. What's Rob's going to hire me. Uh, <laughs> okay, I don't know him. Sakati says, hey, John and crew, today marks my 31st trip around the sun. Seems like yesterday I was in my 20s. <laughs> uh, where is time going? Love y'all and keep it filthy. Well, happy birthday, man. And thank you for spending wow. part of your birthday here with us a lot of doing birthdays. our little show. A lot of birthday stuff today. So may you have a great day and a great year ahead of you, man. 27. All right. What's next? All right. We're going to move on to our members. Uh, and again, got to fix the shot there. And I don't know why sometimes this disconnects. You know. So just, uh, bear with me, know. guys. Here we go. All right. Um, 
So first up, we'll start with uh, Sir Malmsten. Darren Aronofsky's Noah was released this week in 2014. Uh, was it good? Reviews are mixed. Still seems to have legs. Top 10 now on Netflix. Noah. It, 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 Russell Crowe, right? Yeah. And uh, and um, uh, Breaking Bad Boy. Not Brian Cranston. Uh, Aaron. 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 Paul. Paul. Aaron Paul. Thank you. Not bad, not great. It, it's one of those ones that I watched once. It's like, oh, that was all right. But I didn't, you know, I didn't think it was particularly remarkable. Um, hugely ambitious movie, though. Yeah. Very ambitious movie. All right. What's next? All right. We got Under Kelly who says uh, Heisenberg coming out in August or the new Golden Girls reboot. Which one comes I'm not with? familiar with either of these. Well, Heisenberg, I'm guessing he's talking about something having to do with. Probably bad. Bring bad. Series or what? Or is it actually Heisenberg? Right. Is there really a Golden Girls reboot coming, or is this I, that know. also? Is I'm this not a joke that with. I'm not getting. Yeah, I have no idea what we're talking about. To be honest with you. All right, what's next? Okay, well, uh, Christopher Baker says I saw Ghostbusters last night and it was okay. I can really feel the difference in the directors. What would it take to capture that feeling Ghostbusters Afterlife gives you? Ivan Wright, Jason Reitman. Yeah. Well, number one, have Jason Reitman directed again. Um, he truly is one of the best directors we have out there today. I mean, he's just, when you, like, I think if you talk to a lot of people, Jason Reitman, what did he do again? And then if you list off all the movies he's done, they'd be like, holy shit. Up really? in the air. Well, up in the air, Juno, thank you for smoking. Um, the one he did with uh, Hugh Jackman. So it appears from that last question, these are two like hoaxes that have just been debunked. Uh, oh, okay. Golden so Girls yeah, Reboot. there you go. I, that's why I never heard of either yeah. of them. Like I, I yeah. have no idea what these projects are. All right, what's next? Uh, Dwayne says, this is interesting. Uh, Sony dropped the Spider-Verse short, The Spider Within. It's really good. Small short about Miles dealing with anxiety. Have you guys seen it? No, I just saw the headline today that, uh, that it's dropped. I assume it's on Disney Plus. Is that where it is? I would assume. Or is it because Sony oh. doesn't have a streaming service? Yeah. I assume it's I, I have no idea where it is, but I mean, you know what a big fan of I am of, oh, of these things. So I'm, I'll definitely check it out. I oh, actually, they're saying it's on YouTube. I actually take that back. The Golden Girl, Girls reboot is actually a real thing. All right. I'm sorry. Still don't care about it. Well, but thank you for being good. a friend. T but thank you for being a friend. But apparently it's free on YouTube. So I'm going to have to go and check that out. Okay. Nice. All right. What's next? Fian Cleary says Hi, John. Is there a movie for you? Uh, that has a lot of rewatchability due to its lead performance. For me, it's John Cusack in Gross Point Blank. Such a good movie. So good. I would, I would stick with John Cusack and, and say, um, uh, oh, God, why, why am I blanking on the name? Where he owns a record High, store. High Fidelity. High Fidelity. High Fidelity. I love that movie. Lost um, count how many times I've seen it. I would also so say good. John Cusack, but I'd go Hot Tub Time Machine. Um, <laughs> sure thing. I, I mean, sure. I watched a lot of Zoolander. Not Zoolander 2. A lot of Zoolander because Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson have a kind of on-screen comedic chemistry that is hard to replicate in that first one. Hansel, so hot right now. Hansel, it's so good. Will Ferrell's so good in it. Everybody's so good in it. Um, I mean, again, that is not my favorite comedy of all time, but Zoolander is remarkably rewatchable to me. Uh, Galaxy Quest, not the best movie. It's not in my top. 20 favorite films of all time but it's insanely rewatchable i can watch galaxy quest all the time and never get tired of it rewatchability is such a nebulous thing about it's it's because rewatchability isn't about the overall quality of the film because i've got some you know some movies like i, I couldn't watch the godfather today it's one of the greatest films of all time but i don't know that i could watch it once a month for the rest of my life oh, but then there are movies that are nowhere near as good but I could very easily just sit down and watch them again. So I don't know how to define it. <laughs> the you social network, dude. Oh, uh, I could watch the social network. I mean, that's modern. If I go back in time, almost famous. And if I go back in time for that, all that jazz. But the social network, I could watch that movie every day. That movie is infinitely rewatchable to me. You know what else is infinitely rewatchable? Is Steve Jobs. Oh, you like with, Jobs? With Michael Fassbender, right. yeah. Um, I, by the way, I just got a, somebody just made, did a quote from Zoolander. Oh, I'm sorry. Did my pin get in the way of your ass? Go and lose, fi lose five pounds immediately. <laughs> Will Ferrell's so good in that. All right. What's next? Uh, Dark Smirk says, what's your most and least favorite sitcom finale? Uh, I loved Cheers, Community, The Office, Third Rock from the Sun, and New Art. Worst is Seinfeld, in my opinion. Yeah, Seinfeld is one of the worst series finales in history. Mm -hmm. I um, loved the Cheers finale. It was great. 
I, I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't love the Cheers finale. I, I love, you know what? It should have, Cheers should have ended when Shelley Long left the show. Well, yeah. And I'm not saying that they didn't do anything good after that, but I remember when, when Ted Danson is standing there and he, she leaves and he says, have a good life. That's a great yeah. ending to a series right there. Of course, the greatest ending to any series to me is all good things of Star Trek Next Generation. Like that, they good answer. The, as a series finale, that was a perfect series finale. Um, other good ones, there's not many good series finales. I like the MASH series finale. It was yeah, a big goodbye. Fan. Dude, that was a, I literally one threw of the highest I watched that recently. episodes of television broadcast ever in the history of television, by the way. Yeah. And I thought Dinosaurs. Friday Night Lights had a great final Dinosaurs episode. is a really dark ending. That that was That was sad. depressing and dark. <laughs> It's like, because it. five minutes after the show ended, they all died. <laughs> so it's like, eh. Like, especially, you know what's really moving? When the baby's like, are we going to be okay? No, little baby. You're going to die in a few minutes. Well, like, it's, yeah. I don't know, it's a few minutes, but they, what's worse is they starved to death, probably. Yes, it froze to death, well, starved to death. Gosh, it. you guys are so Great. morbid. So morbid today. All right, what's next? Oh, that was, okay. I'm just going to go jump off the balcony here. <laughs> Uh, Jose Reyes says Hulu officially in Disney Plus. Yep. yep. We were, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Yeah. Uh, which song are Espinosa? Yeah. Espinosa says what? Sorry. Which song or album do you think would make a great movie for me? I want to see a film adaptation of American Idiot by Green Day. How would you do that? It's kind of interesting, but. Uh, there's no way to answer that question because like you could take any song, but then, you know, there's a million different ways you can make a movie out of that song. Styx is the grand illusion. Come they, stale away, John. They tried Come a movie. Away. They, Styx tried a movie. It didn't work it out It was great. terrible. <laughs> it was horrible. But that was... Um, like my, as I'm trying to think of a way you could make my all-time favorite song into a movie. And I, I don't know that you can. My, by the way, my all-time favorite song is Where the Streets Have No Name. I was no going to say, it'd make a great Twilight Zone episode. Yeah. Where the streets have no name. Yeah, where the streets have no name. All, all time favorite. You know, it'd be great, and they, I don't know why they've never done it. But Pink Floyd did this album called The Wall. They should do that. <laughs> if only, if only some visionary had the idea to. How about at least that. putting it out on Blu-ray or 4K? <laughs> Roger Waters. Why well, you gotta be Ron, that way? Ron H. Very correctly says they've already done it. Ice, ice, baby. Oh, yeah. Vanilla yep. Ice, Cool as Ice. They basically mm. took that song and made it into. They a released movie. four different versions of that as a special edition 4K disc in Germany. Yeah, that's how great. Of that Cool was. as Ice. God, the Germans got it right. <laughs> <laughs> Not, you know what? Got to be very careful in the context in which you say that. But in terms of <laughs> well, as far as their physical the media of, DVD, of that movie, the Germans got it right. Four different out, four different versions of Ice Ice Baby. I mean, uh, Cool as Ice in 4K. Oh, and uh, is it Cardi B that does wet ass pussy? Is that her? Is it Cardi Plus B that? A. Oh, no, is that Megan Thee Stallion? <laughs> Who does that? That's in Joyride. La Roche. Plus the a. song they do, they do in Joyride. Make that, right. make that into a movie. All right, what's next? Okay, this is a longer one, but I thought it was a important one. So, Gio the <laughs> one says, "I have dealt with addiction, and oh. my and most vulnerable time is after work, and that's when your show airs. Thanks to your help, keeping my mind busy during that time." I'm now six months clean. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, of course, uh, with a lot of hard work on top of that, too. Uh, you have much more impact than you even realize. Well, dude, first of all, thank you for saying that. That's that's incredible. I, I'm very lucky um, that I've never... I'm very fortunate and lucky that I've never had to struggle with addiction. I've known a lot of people in my life who have. And almost whatever addiction you're talking about, addiction is a powerful thing, man. And I am always floored and amazed by people who are able to overcome whatever their addiction is, because it is not easy. You know, I, you know, you get your, a lot of people who say, well, just stop, just stop your smoking or your drinking or your drugs or your, whatever it is that Hot you're addicted to, right? Yeah. Gambling or whatever. You know, we'll just, just stop. And like, I, I, while I can't say firsthand, I've talked to a lot of people and I've known a lot of people who've had it and it's, and it's not easy. So I'm always amazed by people like yourself who have been able to, not going to say overcome it because it's an ongoing struggle, but have been able to get to that point where you are like triumphing over it. Six on a months day -day is, basis. that's good. That's huge. That's six months is huge. a lot of people. Yeah, so congrats, congrats, man. That's awesome, and I'm glad we can be a small part of it. Thank you for sharing that with us, man. All right, what's next? Okay. 
Puking McFisty <laughs> says, with the success of Ghostbusters opening weekend, do you think they'll do one more or wrap things up? Will the second weekend drop off matter in this decision? Thanks and bring on the pukey. Um, who did I say was Pukey McFisty? Uh, Terry McGinnis. Oh, Terry, that's right. Who's Batman? Pukey McFisty? I can't remember his name. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's totally the same thing. Opening weekend will not determine anything. They could have had an opening weekend half as much, but if it has great legs and goes on to make them a lot of money, they'll do it, even if they had a small opening weekend. They're about to get stepped on. They're about to get crushed in their second weekend. I'm predicting more than a 60% drop on its second weekend because for two reasons. One, you got Godzilla and Kong coming. Mm. Number two, it's just not that good of a movie. It's not that I mean, I listen, overall, I liked Ghostbusters Fro Frozen Empire. But it's, I'm not, I don't plan to see you again. Um, I, I, so even without Godzilla versus Kong, I don't think it was going to have a very good second weekend. So it really all depends on what's its final box office number. It's not its opening weekend. It's its final box office number. And I don't think, I'm just guessing, and I could be wrong. My guess is it will not be big enough for them to justify doing a third. Rob, do you think we're going to see a third one? No, not with, I, I don't. And, and for the reasons you just laid out, the movie has to make a decent, we're talking three, $400 million. I don't think it will. All right, two more. What's next? All right, Dylan's Dialogue says, Hey, John, did you ever get a chance to see Love Lies Bleeding with Kristen Stewart? Such a tense and thrilling movie that had my jaw on the floor with its visceral violence. Finally did. Now, I made a mistake. Remember I told you that Chris Carr saw it and she thought Madam Webb was better? That was... That was like... That two, was the Coen brothers. The, two the, women driving down the road. Yeah, whatever, uh, whatever, whatever they, That was that Drive one. Driveway Dolls. Driveway yeah. Dolls. That was Driveway Dolls that I meant. So I, I misspoke when I said it was Love Lies Bleeding. She actually loved Love Lies Bleeding. I finally saw Love Lies Bleeding. It's fantastic. Did you see that the lead, not Kristen Stewart, but the other lead got cast in the new Mission Impossible? Oh, I did not. That was in the news this morning. Um, yeah, it's it's really good. I don't think it's an Oscar contender, but it's it's really good. I've uh, heard that. I actually oh, quite enjoyed it a lot. Good for Chris, uh, or whatever. <laughs> her name Kristen is. Stewart. Yeah, good for her. Good for her. Good for her. Good for her. All good right, for what's you. next? Uh, Elba Bayaga says, after Godzilla minus one, it's less my excitement for God. Oh, it less my ex excitement for Godzilla uh, X Kong. It just feels like those movies became Batman and Robin, while Minus One is uh, Nolan Batman. So do you think it's losing box office following Minus One? Success? Again, I, people hate it when I say it, but nobody saw Godzilla Minus One. That's just a fact. Sorry. Uh, so, no, I don't think it's... And, and here's the other thing. Um, people like the spectacle of this, though. Yeah. It's, it it's more people. The reality is more general movie going on. He says are more align themselves with the spectacle of Godzilla versus Kong than with the greater depth that yeah. Godzilla minus right. one had. Yeah, it's it's the one. same reason like when people would say to me when Dune 2 was coming out saying, Dune 2 is going to make a billion dollars. And I'm like, no, it's not. Good. Because it doesn't have that popcorn... Um, you it's know, an that, art film. It's, it's a European art science film. fiction art film. Yes. I mean, God, God, minus one is about the people. Godzilla was the catalyst, right? For yeah for what they they were dealing with after World War II. In these Godzilla, it's all about the monsters. The monsters are the main characters. Yeah, yeah we're, we're going and, and their territory. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're messing exactly. with them. <laughs> yeah, and so it's it's not a matter of saying, well, you know, Godzilla minus one is better, and therefore, it, well, that's not the point. The point is, even though Dune 2 is the best movie I've seen in years, it's not a wide appeal popcorn kind of film, and I love my wide appeal popcorn films, but those are the ones that are going to attract more people. I guarantee you Godzilla Minus One is not going to hurt no. Godzilla X Kong one bit. Now, how much the movie makes, I'm not sure. But whatever it makes, it'll have nothing to do with Godzilla and, Minus One. And also, try not to do that to yourself. This is a time where we're getting two different Godzillas, two different themes, two different, yep. you know, enjoy both. Two Godzilla different fan, approaches. Yeah, yeah. you've you <laughs> got to you love not, that there's this one. They're not even the same movie to compare. I mean, it's just two different feels. If you told me when I was a little kid that we would get two Godzilla movies in the theater in, in like three or four months of one another and one was going to cost like $200 million and the other You'd one was going to... You'd say, gonna, I believe it if it was minus one. I, I, no, I would never I would never have believed it in any universe. Yeah. The fact that we're getting two Godzilla movies is insane and well, one is electric pink and small, rob small correct planet of the apes wow. it's like you get all your wishes uh, uh, all of my childhood stuff yeah there's i'm getting i mean think about it we got an omen movie coming out yeah 
It's all for you, Damien. It's all for you. <laughs> we're getting we're getting Planet of the Apes. We're getting Alien. Yeah. With Romulus coming. I mean, yep. I mean, we're getting it's like my childhood all over again. What you're that says about chance. the state of the American entertainment industry, I don't know what. But that just to says. be clear, just to clarify though, for our audience at home, it's one Godzilla movie, one King Kong movie with special guest star Godzilla. <laughs> Just, okay. just yeah just putting that out what Let's it means stay. for what it means is gen xers like yourself are now in power at the studios and they're like we're gonna yep. do this uh, again <laughs> it's true Let's go at least someone's not going okay boomer all you're right guys i'm not a boomer i'm an xer and that'll do it for today's installment <laughs> of the john campion show podcast thank you so much for being here and helping me celebrate my eight dollar win mm -hmm. with the mega millions jackpot yeah. i want to thank all of you guys so much especially those of you who sent in the questions whether you use the super chat or whether you're one of our beloved youtube channel members and used uh, our uh, community tab to send in questions number one because he gave us interesting things to talk about number two you support our channel by doing it and all of us involved with the show thank you guys so much for your support uh, don't forget to come on back and join us again tomorrow i want to thank the people in the room with me ray aura you can get two six pieces with that eight two six $8. pieces jonathan voico <laughs> see you guys later writer director producer robert meyer burnett i'm getting a star trek book in the mail today <laughs> fabulous my name's john campia and until next time my friends bye-bye